All right, our last speaker of the afternoon is Emmanuel Renneke, speaking on cohomological vanishing for moduli of curves. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, cohomological vanishing for uh, moduli of curves. And uh, to keep this talk accessible, I just want to start by explaining a couple of words in the title of my talk. So uh, let me start with uh, smooth curves. So when I think about curves in the sense of algebraic geometry, so as um, smooth projected um, varieties of dimension one, and in my talk already complex numbers. Um, and if you're not an algebraic geometer, you can also think about these as compact Riemann surfaces, so compact connected complex manifolds of dimension one. Where we have this bad coincidence that since C has um, two dimensions over the real numbers, this is called a surface. So um, as an example, we could look at a sphere, for example, we could look at a torus, or we could add more handles to this torus and can get, um, get other Riemann surfaces. And now, if we have introduced this class of objects, one natural question could be if we can classify all these objects that fit this definition. Um, okay, and maybe a first pass at such a classification would be by a number of handles that I already mentioned. So this is the genus that most of us have probably seen. So on the left, we'd have genus zero, then genus one, and then genus two, so two handles, and you can keep going. Now, um, this genus completely determines the structure of these curves as topological surfaces, um, but it doesn't tell us much about the uh, complex structure. So next, maybe we're interested in fixing one such uh, genus and um, think about the different complex structures we could put on um, such a Riemann surface. And that is achieved by uh, moduli spaces of curves so what is a moduli space? Well, you can think about it as a certain topological space, or if, you, if you're an algebraic geometer, maybe you're going to think about it as an algebraic stack, or maybe as an orbifold of your differential geometer um, that classifies all these uh, different complex structures. And if you want to determine, say, a topological space, which will be enough for the uh, purposes of this talk, then uh, first maybe let's think about what this is as a set. Well, basically, from this classification problem, the uh, points of this topological space should be one-to-one -one correspondence with isomorphism classes of um, smooth genus G curves. But now if you want to um, put a topology on the space, um, you maybe want to think about what does it mean for uh, two curves to be close to each other. And it turns out that um, the right answer to this question is to think about families of curves. So given two curves, I want to say they're close if there's a family of curves where these two curves occur as fibers over points that are somehow close to each other. So that basically leads us to say, well, the line in this uh, topological space should be uh, nice in some sense, family of uh, smooth curves over that line. And then you can keep going and do this over more general subspaces of your uh, topological space. So it turns out you can um, define such topological space and the subspaces somehow uh, could be nice to look at if you want to look at spaces that parameterize certain uh, curves with extra uh, properties. Okay, so we've defined this topological space, and one of the first things we might want to do is study its topological properties. Okay, for example, one can show that this um, space is connected, and that's already an interesting result because it tells us that the genus is, is essentially the only discrete invariant that we can use to classify curves. If we want to say more about complex structures, then in some sense we need to have a continuous parameterization. You can't find any more discrete invariants. Okay, so maybe we're a little bit, a bit more ambitious. I want to say something about the cohomology of MG. And let me not be too ambitious and just try to think about singular cohomology with rational coefficients. So it turns out that that is already a very hard question. Um, you would maybe start by thinking about what the uh, dimensions of the different cohomology groups are. And there's a famous result to Hara and Zadier, which tells us that if you look at the Euler characteristic, um, so the, uh, the alternating sum of the dimensions of the cohomology groups, it's given by some very nice formula in terms of uh, Bernoulli numbers, and that tells us 
that uh, this Euler characteristic grows about as fast as a g to the 2g, so extremely fast. And this tells us that there must be a lot of homology somewhere. Okay, now the second goal could be to, to identify which cohomology groups this cohomology occurs. And I try to draw a little number line here. So, um, so mg is very close to a manifold of a dimension 6 g minus 6, real dimension 6 g minus 6, so we only expect homology up to degree 6 g minus 6. And you can see that there's these uh, three areas here. There's the red area, the black area, and the uh, blue area. And we uh, can say almost everything in the red part and the blue part, and we can say very little in the um, black part. So that is still open. People try to study certain subrings of cohomology in that area. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot of open questions. So let me maybe say a little bit about um, the red and the blue part. Um, in the red part, we have a famous theorem of mass and whites. And essentially, it says that the cohomology in this range is given by a polynomial algebra over certain very natural uh, cohomology classes, um, which are these kappa classes. And then it turns out that in the blue range, the cohomology actually vanishes, which you might not have expected from the fact that uh, the dimension is uh, 6 to minus 6. That's a result of pairing. Um, and this result is essentially optimal. So um, there's a recent preprint of uh, Chang, Galatius, and Thane that says that uh, the dimension of the cohomology in um, degree 4 g minus 6 grows exponentially uh, in g. One thing I want to mention about these two theorems of Mads and Weiss and Herring is that the proofs of both are extremely topological. Um, so for example, in Harris' result, he um, looks at something that is very close to the universal covering space of Mg, uh, the type meter space, which turns out to be uh, contractible, and then he can uh, concretely compute the group cohomology of the depth transformation group. Um, but if in algebraic geometry, maybe you notice that that everything in this um, theorem can be defined algebraically. So there's an algebraic way to define modular spaces of curves, and there's also an algebraic analog of, of singular cohomology. Um, so one natural question that was uh, put forward is if there's a way to prove this vanishing result just using algebraic geometry. And then there's maybe another question. So, so far we've only been considering smooth curves, but very often you, um, you encounter curves that are not smooth. So is it possible to also prove vanishing results for those type of curves? Um, and before I want to say a little bit like a first step toward an answer to those questions, I want to speak a little bit about what, what other kind of curves you might be interested in. Um, so the first class of curves you might be interested in are stable curves. Why are those important? Well, I told you before that to understand the marginalized space of curves, you're interested in understanding families of curves. And now what could happen is that you start with this nice smooth curve, you look at a, a, a closed curve on it, and you pinch it together more and more. And then if you go to some limit, um, this curve requires a singularity. It looks like a node. So in some sense, um, when you want to have a nice way to talk about families, maybe you want to include those uh, curves that have modal singularities, and then you need to put some extra assumptions like having finite automorphism. So that's one type of uh, curve that you might be interested in, and it turns out that is again parameterized by a modular space. Um, so another type of curve you might be interested in are curves of compact type. Um, those are stable curves that satisfy a um, certain extra condition that I want to explain now. Um, so you can see here that these uh, stable curves are essentially glued together uh, from other curves. Um, and I'm giving you two more examples here. Sorry, I was not very good at paint. But, um, right, so you can see on the left, you have this a genus 2 uh, curve that is glued to a genus 1 curve. And whenever you have such a gluing data, that's best encoded in the dual graph of the curve, um, which is a graph uh, where the vertices correspond to the, the components that you're gluing together. And you have an edge between two vertices if the components are glued together. So if you're on the left, you'd have this line, and then on the right, you'd have this uh, triangle that I tried to combine. And the curve is of compact type if this dual graph is a tree. Okay, so on the left, you have something of compact type, and on the right, it would not be of compact type. And often it's very easy, or it's maybe a little bit easier to understand these curves of compact type, and then you can use that as a stepping stone toward uh, stable curves. 
Then, of course, you have the modular space of smooth curves, and we have, um, we have inclusions from bottom to top. Now, another type of, uh, of other modular spaces that I want to talk about is modular spaces of curves with level structure. So, I told you before that maybe this modular space is nicest if you think about it as an algebraic stack or maybe an order fold. But if you want to, um, if you want to avoid talking about uh, these notions, there's a way to do that by finding a finite cover of this modular space. And it turns out that this finite cover is, in fact, the smooth variety or smooth manifold. And this uh, finite cover again um, parameterizes certain data, namely it parameterizes curves together with a trivialization of the uh, first homology group. It's called a full, uh, full level structure. And you, can you find this level structure for every integer, uh, for every national number, I guess? And if two national numbers divide each other, then you get a map between these modular spaces. So if I want to look at uh, powers of a certain prime, then I get this entire tower of modular spaces. And uh, I'm doing this here for smooth curves, but you can do something similar for uh, curves of compact type and for stable curves. Okay, so I have these uh, modular spaces, and if I look at their cohomology, um, I get a direct system of cohomology groups, and I can take its direct limit. So the uh, first step to the, uh, to the answers to the two questions that I want to give um, is the statement about this direct limit of these cohomology groups. Now, the first question was about if you can do things algebraically, so if I um, when I talk about cohomology in an algebraic way, I want to use the cohomology and here with fp coefficients. And it turns out that uh, this direct limit is zero for a modular smooth curves in exactly the same range of degrees as for Harris theorem. Uh, so one thing I want to point out is that, although it is not entirely clear from the way I stated it, uh, this statement for a smooth curves actually follows from the, uh, the methods that Harris uses. So the main novelty here would be the way that it is proven in the, um, I guess, almost completely algebraic. Um, but then you also get uh, similar statements for uh, curves of compact type and stable curves that, as far as I know, cannot be um, approached using the Paris method. And you even get a slightly better bound of about uh, 3.5 G uh, in these two cases. So I think I'm essentially out of time, so let me maybe uh, stop here. Are there any questions for the speaker? So can you deduce the vanishing at level one? Right, I cannot. Um, so that would be a very interesting question, but I don't really know how to approach that question. For constant curves, do you use the relation with moduli of abelian varieties? Yes, exactly. So I look at the Vitorelli uh, map to modulo of abelian varieties, and then I use this uh, machine of differential spaces to um, say something about the cohomology of that modular space and then use um, spectral sequences to, to relate that back to cohomology of uh, modular curves. I'm confused. What does a level structure mean in the case where it's not of compact type? Right. So you want to uh, kind of put a so the problem is when you're not of compact type, the uh, homology kind of doesn't have the right size, right? So you want to put a scaffy structure on the nodes that uh, makes the cohomology get to be of right size. So um, that's a thing done in some paper of the Bramovich, Korch, and Bristolin, and they call this three level anchors. They also allow other level structures. Do you have anything about what you have here? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, I think you mentioned uh, both in Deline and Mumford, and I think Abramovitz and somebody. Uh, they have other level structures on the moduli when you not oh, just non abelian level structures. Yeah, so that would be a very interesting question to see what happens for these uh, non abelian level structures. Yeah, okay. Any other questions for the speaker? Thank you again.